so uh, my name is Osam Dawa and uh, Chris, uh, thankfully, he presented me very well. Thank you, Chris, again. Uh, today, we are going to speak about the fundamentals of uh, 3D radiology uh, in general and more specifically about the CVCT and its application in uh, dentistry. So here's a little bit a uh, hint about the history, uh, how all the things they started. So uh, in the late 70s, uh, Sir Hounsfield, he presented the MDCT, uh, and in the late 80s, uh, the CBCT was presented. And probably the biggest breakthrough, it was with the introduction of uh, the so softwares um, that they were developed to convert uh, the axial into a cross-sectional, which was uh, our uh, breakthrough in uh, dentistry. Before we go into depth uh, into the uh, CT scan or the CBCT, I would like to make a little comparison uh, between the uh, 2D radiographs and the 3D radiographs. So we have in the uh, 2D uh, photograph, uh, radiograph, sorry, uh, the periaptical. Uh, which is a very good tool because it's very um, uh, it's readily available and it's very easy to use in any uh, dental uh, setup. It's very accurate uh, and helpful in the mesiodistal uh, or the horizontal uh, dimension for in the uh, interproximal uh, situation between teeth uh, or uh, different structures in the mouth. Uh, it's not re reliable though. Uh, to check the length of uh, the objects. And the OPG, um, it's very good to have a, a generalized idea about the, the teeth and the different structures and the bone structure uh, and the anatomy uh, of our patient. Uh, it's relatively uh, accurate in the anterior region of the mandible. Uh, and um, it's got uh, this magnification factor of roughly uh, about 25%, uh, but it's got uh, a born error uh, distortion uh, of about 0.3%, uh, uh, and this uh, distortion, it will increase as we go uh, more distally in our image. So it's not really that reliable um, in the mesiodistal uh, dimension or horizontal, but in the vertical or to check the length of uh, the teeth or uh, different objects inside the mouth, it's very reliable. Well, the MDCT, uh, the medical CT scan, and the CBCT, the comb beam uh, scan, uh, they give us a one-to-one -one, uh, volumetric data. The resolution uh, compared to the conventional uh, radiography is much higher and it gives uh, both technologies, they give uh, uniform data as well. What are the radiation? Just to put things in, into perspective and to make a little comparison between the conventional uh, radiograph and the uh, 3D radiographs and the annual intake here, uh, I put a little chart that shows, for instance, that uh, depending on the machine of the CVCT that we are le uh, leading with, uh, we might have the same uh, amount of radiation exposure as a normal OBG, or in uh, different equipment, we have up to uh, 10 times more uh, compared to a normal uh, OBG. And we can uh, see a big difference between the MD CT scans and the CPCT. Uh, we can see that the amount of exposure in the MD uh, CT scans is much higher. Um, just to, to understand things better, uh, the human being uh, gets like uh, three times uh, the amount of radiation as taking uh, uh, MD uh, CT scan. For, for, uh, that's annually. And here, uh, just to understand the differences between the two technologies, the medical CT scan and the CBCT uh, scan, um, the CT scan, uh, the medical CT scan, uh, normally it uses a fan-shaped uh, X-ray beam, and this it will take one image at a time. So each slice is uh, an exposure, and then uh, this linear group it will uh, go to the detector that it will ca uh, catch one slice at a time. While in the CBCT we use the comb beam uh, shaped uh, uh, detector, 
uh, that it will uh, capture uh, the full volume at once in a single uh, 360 degree uh, uh, rotation. And the uh, shape and the size of uh, the voxels uh, between the two technologies is different. Uh, while in the CVCT, uh, the voxels, they are uniform, they are isotropic. Uh, we can see that it's not the case in the medical uh, CT. Uh, they are uh, not uniform and they um, are anisotropic. And this for sure will uh, affect uh, the resolution because normally in the medical uh, CT, we have a, a poor resolution compared uh, to the isotropic voxels that we have uh, in the CBCT, uh, which translate into uh, a better uh, resolution. So the main differences between the, the MDCT and the CBCT is the spatial resolution with an advantage for the CBCT uh, and the uh, radiation exposure, which is much less in the CBCT. The acquisition, acquisition protocols, they are a little bit different. Uh, and the acquisition time, uh, which is less as well in the CBCT, the size uh, of the machines and the cost of the respective machines as well. So why do we use the CBCT? It, uh, as I mentioned before, it gives us a volumetric data of one-to-one -one, uh, in our area of interest, uh, which is the maxillofacial region. Uh, to carry on uh, not only the, diagnosis, the, the diagnostic process, but even uh, the planning process. It provides us a very reasonable radiation uh, doses uh, compared to other techniques. The compact size of the machines, now it allows to integrate it easily in our uh, clinical environment. The low cost as well is very important, and by the time you are seeing uh, the, the value or, or the cost of the machine is getting lower and lower, and the technology itself is getting uh, even better. As it's very important uh, to integrate any, any new gadget in our uh, uh, offices, we need uh, something easy to use, and that's the case in most of the uh, uh, new or modern uh, CBCT uh, machines. Um, uh, nowadays, uh, we don't need actually a very specific or a highly qualified course to be uh, able to um, operate uh, a CBCT machine, normally a two days course or three days course for the dentist and the staff, and they will be uh, fine to uh, operate the machine uh, in a very uh, um, nice way. It allows us well um, having the, the set of data, which is the DICOM uh, generated from the CBCT, it allows to integrate this set of data with other clinical and digital data that has been uh, uh, collected from our patient. And the accessibility, the integration of, of the machine in the clinical environment, it's very easy nowadays. What are the applications? Why do you use it in dentistry? Well, first, after uh, making the uh, reconstruction of our 3D object out of the uh, DICOM set of data, we are able uh, to to incorporate or to add the virtual wax up. And this will help us to carry on and continue with our reverse engineering uh, treatment planning concept. It will help us as well to overcome uh, the challenges uh, in the aesthetic and uh, in the aesthetic area in the anterior maxilla. Uh, having more data, three dimensional data, it will help us to analyze this. Uh, um, in 360 degrees uh, range uh, and uh, to integrate other uh, sets of data. Uh, in the cases when we uh, have uh, an excess of bone or insufficient bone volume, uh, we will be able to check this beforehand and uh, accordingly we will be able to uh, fabricate the guides uh, either uh, for the bone reduction or uh, some stents uh, or uh, nets to make uh, uh, the bone grafting as well, depending on the case. Um, in uh, more advanced techniques, when we have the extreme lack of, uh, of bone structure, 
um, it will help us as well to detect these cases. Uh, like in this case, uh, in this example I'm showing here uh, um, in this uh, photograph, uh, um, we are able to uh, uh, plan our zygomatic implant uh, beforehand and to be even more predictable, even if we need distraction for uh, a very thin uh, bone bridge or grafting. Uh, the CBCT is something really necessary nowadays to um, uh, improve our outcome. Eventually, it will help us to create our uh, virtual patient. Uh, something nowadays is very common. Um, it will help us to, um, to have all uh, the information needed uh, collected and fused uh, in one file uh, in our computer while our patient is away. Uh, we can make uh, all the diagnosis and the treatment planning. Even we can go uh, further and we fabricate, uh, we design first our guides and then we fabricate. As you can see in this example, all the different, uh, different layers uh, starting from the CBCT until the intraoral scans uh, and the future uh, prosthetic and occlusal setup all incorporated to the uh, uh, facial scan. Uh, it's very helpful as well uh, to identify uh, the specific anatomy, uh, as in the case of uh, INA, uh, for example, to be able uh, to precisely uh, know uh, the availability of bone over uh, the nerve uh, to maximize the amount of bone needed to have the best an anchorage for our implant, for instance. And it will help us to, um, to deal with any uh, strange findings, like it's in the case of this impacted uh, canine, uh, and if it's feasible to, uh, to place our implant, or we have to remove the, the canine first and graft, etc. So it will, it's very uh, helpful uh, to make our uh, treatment planning uh, in a very uh, methodological and uh, predictable way. Again, it's very helpful to check with a, a specific uh, and uh, uh, hidden uh, um, situations. Uh, as you can see in this example here, uh, uh, with this depression of the lingual aspect of the mandible, uh, if we will go only for conventional radiograph uh, and the clinical palpation and uh, believing that we are uh, in a good shape, we might have a surprise of perforating the lingual uh, aspect of the mandible and eventually um, punching the um, lingual artery. Again, for hidden uh, unerupted teeth or intraosseous pathology, it's something uh, uh, indispensable nowadays. For fibrosseous lesions, it's the same thing. In endodontics, it's very important. Uh, we know now that, uh, especially the endodont dentists, uh, I'm not one, uh, but they have uh, quite often lots of hidden uh, canals or uh, missed canals in previous treatments, and uh, we encounter lots of clinical uh, situations that we that we don't understand where is the infection is coming from, uh, and the uh, uh, micro uh, CT scan is very helpful actually in detecting uh, these cases. In TMJ uh, imaging, it's very helpful as well to check the, the bony structure uh, of uh, the TMJ. In periodontics as well, uh, it helps uh, to carry uh, out uh, the diagnosis and to plan for further uh, treatments uh, like crown lengthening or uh, gingivectomy. Uh, in a very precise way after creating the guides as well. In uh, orthodontics, it will help us to check the, the growth, uh, the facial growth, and um, eventually we might need to place some mini implants, and the CBCT is helpful in this sense as well uh, to check the airway function uh, and capacity as well. Last, uh, it's very helpful in uh, forensic dentistry as well. Uh, for sure, it's got its drawbacks as any uh, other uh, gadget, uh, and we, tr we will try in this presentation to overcome the drawbacks of uh, this technology. <clears throat> so the first one, although the, the prices are getting lower, 
uh, it's still a considerable uh, amount of money uh, to be dispensed for uh, this machine. So it's something uh, relative, uh, and it depends on the re reality of each uh, dental uh, office. Uh, here's the, the other limitation of the technology that um, uh, normally when we need uh, a higher spatial resolution, uh, this uh, automatically means the higher radiation dose needed uh, to acquire the image. And we have a lack of standardized gray value distribution. And this uh, will result of a lack of soft tissue contrast. Uh, which might uh, um, end up limiting uh, the possibility of integrating uh, other uh, data correctly uh, to our CBCT. When do we use it? So the, the principle that has been set by McDonald, he says that future c cities uh, should be limited to situations where there is a definitive clinical indication with every scan optimized to provide diagnostic CT image at the lowest possible radiation dose. All this can be summarized in this principle, Aladipe or Alara, some people uh, call it, uh, which means that we, ha we have to use the CBCT as low as diagnostically accepted indication patient oriented. So we have to use it the, the minimum possible with the less radiation and only when needed, but when we use it, we have to make sure that we are taking all the information needed to make our uh, correct diagnosis and to make further uh, treatment planning uh, steps. How the workflow works uh, with the CBCT. Uh, so that's the whole process. First of all, um, to make sure that we are respecting the Aladai principle or the Alara principle, we have to go through all this process. The biggest problem is that most of us, we don't uh, actually uh, follow these uh, steps. Uh, and we end up in making the first CBCT, and then we are not happy with the result, or we did not in, uh, uh, integrate the steps that they were needed before, and then we end up making another and another, which is extremely uh, harmful for our patients. So the first thing to, to prevent uh, doing this, we have to make a correct uh, and thorough clinical history and examination. And then we will check if there's a need for conventional radiography depending on the clinical case or not. Uh, and from this point, uh, we will uh, make our first diagnosis. And this first diagnosis will tell us if there's a need for a CBCT or not. Knowing that there's a need for a CBCT, we have to determine beforehand the spatial resolution needed for the specific uh, or for a given uh, clinical situation and the field of view as well. If it's the case for implants, uh, we have to think about fabricating the templates or the stents beforehand as well, not sending the patient for the CBCT and then we discover that there's something missing. Um, Immediately after uh, collecting the CBCT, we have to uh, review thoroughly the result uh, for any uh, different findings and if uh, it has been taken uh, correctly. And then we proceed to uh, our uh, definitive diagnosis or the final diagnosis, and then we carry on with the other steps of our treatment plan. How accurate is the CBCT? To, to understand the accuracy of the CBCT, we have to speak about the resolution of the voxel, understand how, how the voxel concept uh, affects the resolution and the field of view as well, and uh, what are the protocols needed to uh, maximize uh, the resolution and the quality of the image taken. So what is the voxel? The voxel is... Uh, very simply, it's the pixel, which is a square in a two-dimensional world, uh, but with an added dimension, with a, with a third dimension. So the, the voxel is the 3D pixel, okay? So it's a cube, while the pixel is a square. And normally, the CBCT images, uh, not the MD1s, uh, MD uh, CTs, 
They are isotropic, as we mentioned, uh, and they have a high resolution. Uh, um, and the, all the, the image is composed of these uh, cubes. And when, it's, when we speak about the range of uh, resolution, we consider that the very high resolution starts from 8 microns up to 200 microns. And the high resolution is somewhere around 300 microns. And the normal resolution is 400 microns. So you, you, have, uh, you might have noticed that the smaller the voxel is, the higher the resolution is. And when we have a higher resolution, naturally, we are going to need more radiation. We have too many uh, different kinds and uh, trademarks uh, in the market, over uh, 85 uh, different uh, machines. Uh, each machine uh, it's got its own software and it's got uh, its own environment uh, to work with. So the, the spatial resolution between all these machines is somewhere between the 8 microns and the 400 microns. Normally we need the uh, 8 microns or somewhere uh, around the 8 microns, which is called the micro CT, only for uh, the segmentation uh, that sometimes might be needed needed for endo, endo treatment and the resolution of uh, 100 or 150 micron it might be needed for uh, periodontal uh, uh, or micro periodontal treatment taking into consideration the the average uh, deviation uh, in the uh, guided surgery uh, so the literature it shows us that we have two to three uh, degrees angular deviation and one millimeter at the entry point depending if it's the mediodistal or the lingual palatal um, and one to two uh, sorry 1.2 uh, millimeter uh, apically taking this into consideration we can conclude that the uh, precision uh, of the um, uh, guide uh, surgical guide uh, it doesn't really need to be uh, more than uh, 150 up to 200 microns, which means that the resolution for the surgical guide, it could be perfectly uh, sufficient uh, at the range of 100 micron or 200 micron. We don't need a higher resolution than that. Uh, and why we, we try to minimize uh, the, the resolution in some cases, because small uh, voxels with a higher resolution uh, might cause uh, the, the uh, beam hardening or the artifacts uh, that they are harmful for uh, the following steps of our treatment. And another factor uh, um, that is uh, not uh, very positive with the high resolution, uh, when we want a higher resolution image, uh, it means that the acquisition time is going to to, to be uh, high as well, uh, which means that the probability of the patient moving uh, is higher, and this will result in double imaging or artifacts uh, that we, we don't actually need. So that's why we always uh, have to um, minimize, uh, if possible, the, the resolution. And here's a, an example of the differences in the uh, images um, acquired between uh, um, the 200 microns and in the middle you can see the 300 microns and then uh, the 400 microns. So you, we always have to weigh in uh, the uh, risk of radiation from one side and uh, to get uh, an appropriate uh, or a diagnostically valid uh, image as well. Uh, we have to take all the uh, considerations uh, into account uh, because we might be uh, looking to minimize the radiation, but at the same time, we want the quality uh, image. What is the field of view? So the field view is normally the area of interest that we are going to capture uh, and we are going to expose to, uh, to the uh, X-ray beam. And here's an example from the area that has been selected uh, up, 
and the result that we can get uh, in the lower uh, row, as you can see. So, um, when we have a bigger uh, field of view, that means that the radiation is higher. So, we have to um, adjust the field of view according to the patient's age, the anatomy, and the specific area of interest that we are going to uh, examine it. So if we are looking for a wide uh, field of view, uh, which is the case uh, of having uh, several structures, uh, let's say the upper and the lower jaw, uh, this means that the radiation dose is higher. And then uh, it's going to be wise to uh, opt for a lower spatial resolution, not to be harming uh, the patient uh, unnecessarily. And in the case of uh, narrow field of view, so we are looking for a very, for a very specific area, uh, here we have uh, a lower radiation dose. And depending on, on the clinical uh, situation or case, here we can opt uh, either for a higher spatial uh, resolution or we can uh, opt for a lower. It depends on what we are going to do or what we are looking for. What are the acquisition protocols? We have to position our patient correctly. And in this sense, we have to look at two different planes. Uh, the one on the right-hand side is uh, the Frankfurt uh, horizontal plane, and the one on the left-hand side is the mid-facial, uh, uh, the facial midline. And that's an example of how our patient, it, uh, it should be placed on uh, our machine. So we always have to check these two planes. What are the inaccuracies and errors that we might uh, encounter in uh, our images? The first thing is the artifacts, which, the, which they are uh, the, the, the bright uh, uh, streaks that we can see, uh, like in this image, or the dark areas. Um, and that actually uh, happens because the, the, there isn't a sufficient uh, amount of photons that they are uh, reaching to the detector. So um, the photon is hitting a high density uh, object and it's not really reaching the uh, its end uh, result which is touching the detector and it's scattering all over the place uh, what kind of material that we they have high density inside the mouth uh, implants uh, endodontic treatment amalgam restoration all these sort of things uh, they might result in uh, artifacts and they can uh, give us this kind of uh, image so the artifacts are, are things uh, or objects that we see in the image, they don't actually exist inside uh, the mouth. Um, and the thing is that this will make our uh, work even more difficult because we will not be able uh, to integrate uh, like the intraoral scan or other uh, scans uh, to the CT uh, scan. Um, and even the segmentation process is going to be um, hampered as well uh, with this um, uh, artifacts. Lots of CBT, uh, CBCT machines, like in the CareStream machine, I, here I put uh, an example of the CareStream machine. They have a very nice software uh, to reduce the artifacts. Um, and actually, the, the software is called Metal Artifact Reduction or MAR. Uh, so it's just an algorithm uh, that it uh, informatically uh, it will help uh, in making this reduction. Uh, one should be careful that this might uh, be realistic or not. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, these algorithms, they make the picture looks much nicer uh, and uh, probably uh, much easier to be uh, read or interpreted. Uh, but it may not correspond uh, to the real situation inside the mouth because it has been done in the computer. The double imaging, as we spoke as well, uh, it's another problem uh, uh, or an error that we might encounter 
uh, in our images. Sure, uh, the artifacts and the double imaging, uh, they will uh, contribute uh, to error in the data uh, fusion uh, or integration. As it's the case here, if you can see uh, in my screen, the difference between the uh, green line uh, hint and the, the uh, teeth structure, you can see uh, clearly a, a big uh, space between both, which means that this uh, integration or fusion is not correct. And this was due to double imaging. And for sure, this uh, means um, that we will, will not be able to transfer uh, in a very precise way what has been planned and uh, what is inside the mouth of the patient. Um, and the problem is that this kind of errors, if it, it, it wasn't detected or, or uh, prevented right from the beginning, you'll, you'll, we, end up, we might end up having a very uh, unpleasant surprise during our surgery. So we want to help you uh, optimize your CBCT. Knowing now the errors and the limitations of our uh, means and how the technology works, uh, we would like to help you making uh, your CBCT in a more predictable way. So for the mo moving patients, which is the case of the nervous patients or the elderly people, uh, we might advise them to close their eyes after stabilizing their chin um, on, in the machine and closing their eyes uh, might minimize uh, the probability of uh, them moving. And another one, uh, another uh, trick we can make, uh, if we have um, an area of interest uh, that doesn't have metal uh, and um, the rest of the mouth uh, it's got metal, probably it's, it's going to be wise only to choose the area that has no uh, metal uh, just to minimize as well uh, the scattering or the, the beam hardening uh, effect and the artifacts as well. So knowing that the, uh, the need uh, to have a nice uh, uh, surgical guide, uh, the, the, the sufficient resolution is only uh, 200 microns, uh, so we have here to adjust our resolution not to be very high. So we have to, to use the minimum resolution needed uh, to uh, acquire our image. If it's uh, 200 micron or 300 micron, in a way that we uh, minimize the scattering, we, we minimize the time needed for, uh, to acquire our image. And this for sure will help us to have a, a cleaner image and further, uh, we'll be able to make a uh, nicer segmentation uh, and integration of our 3D uh, uh, cast as well. There might be a need for uh, radiographic templates. Uh, we will check when uh, this will be needed. In case the uh, radiographic templates are needed, we have to check the fit in, on the occlusal uh, plane and on the soft tissue uh, level as well. So we have to make sure that our template is really stable and it's not moving and it's well adapted inside the mouth. Because any error at this uh, uh, step, it will uh, be transferred to the other steps of our treatment planning. And for sure, we will not have uh, a guide that uh, um, will guide us through to the correct result. And the material that we want to use uh, for our radiographic templates, it, it should be a very low density material. And even if the, the density is very low, we have to make sure that the uh, thickness of the material is not above what is uh, recommended. So we want it medium to thin uh, thickness uh, material with a very low density, uh, just not to interfere with the, the course of the X-ray. We have to make uh, some tissue isolation, as we spoke, because of the gray uh, contrast, lack of gray contrast uh, in the CBCT, which is a problem. Uh, like here on the left-hand side image, you can see that you cannot really distinguish 
uh, where is the uh, lower lip is and where is the gum is. Uh, there's no kind of separation. It was done in this case. Uh, um, on the contrary, you can see uh, on the right hand side a different uh, example where you can see uh, a full separation between the upper lip and uh, the alveolar uh, buccal aspect uh, of uh, the maxilla. So we need to use the cotton walls uh, or the cotton walls to um, put the cheeks and uh, the lips uh, away uh, to separate uh, this soft tissue uh, from each other uh, to have an idea about the thickness and the contour of our uh, oral soft tissue. In some cases, when, when it's not really needed to uh, scan your patient in uh, CR, uh, it might be very nice idea as well to place some cotton rolls between the upper and the lower uh, jaws uh, to have a nice look at the whole surface of the occlusal uh, surface of, of the teeth. And this will help uh, in two things. First, in the segmentation of each uh, jaw uh, separately, and it will help as well in integrating the uh, intraoral scans in a better way. For sure, uh, we are dentists. We, we work a lot. We have lots of gadgets in our uh, dental setup. Uh, we like to deal with the simple things, uh, not to add very complicated or complex uh, workflows. So guys, make it simple, uh, make uh, the workflow, as I told you, uh, just make everything uh, within uh, a protocol and you'll see that this will help you make things uh, simple, uh, achievable and doable. What do we use the uh, CBCT uh, other than uh, for diagnostics and uh, taking the X-ray image? Uh, uh, besides taking the CBCT for uh, the bony structure, which is um, uh, uh, well, the majority of us do, do uh, this, we can use the same machine to scan the impression. And we can scan the denture and we can scan the surgical template. All the uh, uh, file type that is generated from this scanning is DICOM, which is convertible uh, with specific software. Uh, to STL. We know that uh, available uh, intraoral scans, more or less all, all what is uh, all available in the market, uh, um, they are 10 times more accurate than uh, the image of the CBCT. And the type of file is STL. And we know that uh, we have limitations with the CBCT, which is the spatial resolution, this balance between the spatial resolution and the time of acquisition uh, and the radiation, and we have a limitation with the contrast resolution and the artifacts as well. So at the same time, uh, we know that we want to uh, integrate um, the intraoral scan with the DICOM. Why is that? Because of uh, the limitations that I already mentioned, um, it's not the best way to create your guide on uh, the CBCT. Uh, the best way is to create it on the uh, intraoral scan because it's with a higher accuracy. And this integration should allow us uh, to go further with our treatment planning uh, for uh, more specific uh, digital procedures. We can as well uh, include the facial scan or not, depending on the case. And some CBCT uh, machines, they have their own facial scanners, or we can integrate this with uh, another uh, kind of facial scanner. Here we can speak about two different uh, protocols for scanning our patient with the CBCT the single scan technique and the dual scan technique. The single scan technique, normally uh, we use it when, when we have enough common points of interest. What is that? It means that uh, we have more than five teeth, so we have enough uh, reference 
to stitch uh, the intraoral scan to our CBCT, and this might uh, be applied to the partially dentulous uh, patients, and when we don't have uh, lots of uh, metal uh, restorations that may, may end up causing some artifacts. So when we have edentulous patients with more, more than uh, five teeth uh, and no metal restorations, this ends up uh, giving us a, a nice result of uh, highly uh, predictable uh, dental arches, uh, including our area of interest, which is the teeth and the surrounding uh, alveolar process, which makes our life easier in uh, making the integration of the intraoral scan. So for the single uh, scan uh, technique, what, we, what do we need? We need the CBCT, we need the intraoral scan, uh, actually we need the optical scan, which might be intraoral scan, or it could be uh, a scan that has been taken either with a CBCT machine or with the uh, desktop scan in the laboratory. And the dual scan. The dual scan is needed always when we don't have enough uh, common uh, points of interest. Uh, so we, uh, we use it when we have highly restored cases, lots of metal in the mouth, uh, less than five teeth, uh, edentulous uh, patients as well. And when we are speaking about five teeth, we have to be uh, careful because it's not only a number. It's the way the, the teeth are distributed inside the mouth. If you look at the right-hand side, you side, uh, you find a, a bad example of having six teeth, but I would rather have less teeth, uh, like on the left-hand side, but they are more well distributed. What we don't like to see uh, is this uh, a big or wide area of edentulous uh, uh, ridge, uh, like on the right-hand side. Uh, on the left, um, on the left hand side of the patient and the right hand side of the patient, so it's more favorable to have uh, a clinical situation like on the left hand side. And then we, when we figure out that we need a radiographic uh, template, we have to make sure that our radiographic template is in the ideal prosthetic and occlusal setup, and it's got enough fiducial markers uh, that they are outside the prosthetic uh, envelope to be uh, for us to be able uh, to stitch them uh, later with a CT scan. And always, at all times, we have to be able to check the contour of uh, the gingiva because that's another uh, information that is really important uh, to make sure that we are stitching well or correctly um, uh, both sets of data, the intraoral scan and the CT scan. So what we need to, in, uh, to do in uh, the uh, double scan technique, dual scan technique is, uh, first we scan the patient with the denture or the plastic tray or the impression with the markers. So the, that's the first CVCT. And the second CV, CVCT is going to be the CVCT of the denture or the plastic tray or the impression alone. So here's a, an example. So what you are seeing here is just a plastic tray. And if you look uh, closely, you can see uh, these little markers that they are on the handles and on the lateral uh, ridge of the plastic tray. So I took uh, an alginate impression in this case. I kept the impression inside the mouth of, of my patient and I took the CBCT with the impression and with the tray with the markers. So that's the first CBCT. And then we scanned, we took the, the alginate impression, um, taking care not to cause any distortion for sure. And then we uh, uh, placed the uh, impression in the CBCT and we scanned it. If you want to go further, you can uh, pour some plaster in, uh, in your impression and you make a third scan. That's, not, that's optional. So the optical scan is very, very important why we are looking for the optical scan because it will give us 
uh, more um, accurate uh, information about the soft tissue and uh, it will help us as well uh, to fabricate the um, surgical guide over uh, our uh, surface, the accurate surface. And then our uh, uh, final goal is going to be to merge correctly the digital cast with the CT scan. So all the planning of the dental implant or the surgical planning normally is carried out using the CT data, the DICOM data. But the guide itself, it's uh, designed and fabricated over the optical scan. Take home message. So the CBCT nowadays uh, in any modern facility, uh, uh, it, it should be something uh, very present uh, and available uh, if we are thriving uh, for a more predictable uh, and to enhance uh, treatment and to enhance the outcome uh, for our uh, patients. Thank you very much for listening. Please stay home and stay safe. Thank you.